Um, but I, firstly, I just would like to invite, um, welcome you all to this session, this webinar today. Um, so it's, it's really great that you're able to participate in this joint learning initiative um, hub meeting um, on mobilize, the mobilization hub on um, the mobilization of local faith communities. Um, today's webinar, we are going to be very much focused around uh, disaster, disaster risk reduction um, and engaging local faith leaders. So we've got a great line of upper speakers this, um, this afternoon or this morning. Um, so Nagalan Nasir from Episcopal Episcopal Relief and Development um, based in Sri Lanka and uh, a couple of speakers from Tear Fund, um, Lauren Keje and Lyd Lydia Tanner who's a consultant with um, research people and who is um, working with Tear Fund at the moment so there'll be more of an introduction on them later. Um, my name is uh, Katrina Dujon and I'm also um, based at Tear Fund, um, heading up the impact and effectiveness team and um, Andrea Kaufman, who hopefully will be able to get back on the line um, in, in time for the, um, the discussion, um, heads up um, World, World Vision's work around uh, faith and humanitarian response and the role of faith in, in um, the work that they do. So um, we've got a great um, um, lineup of, of, of discussion today. Um, it's also great that we've got a real mixture of people from a different, from a variety of different organisations on the call today. Um, so we really look forward to having um, a great discussion. I'm just going to hand over now to Stacey um, at the JLI, who's just going to um, give a little bit more on the practical notes, um, and then we'll we'll jump into the discussion if that's okay. So I think on the on the um, the screen now you should be able to see a brief outline of, of what we're going to cover today on the webinar. So I'll hand over to Stacey, and then we'll jump into the into the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Katrina. And for all of those who I haven't met before, I am the JLI and I support the JLI Learning Hubs as well as communications and a few other things. So if, um, this, just noting that this webinar is being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded, please keep your microphone turned off. We will also be sharing the webinar recording on the JLI as well as through our social media posts as soon as the webinar is finished and we can get that up. So as far as just a few pointers on the Zoom technology so you can get the best out of the webinar, if you move your mouse in the Zoom screen, you'll be able to see the menu options at the bottom of the screen. So there you'll find the chat button, which looks like a little, I guess, cloud. Um, and then you can chat with everyone or specific people during the webinar. So you can send your questions at any point in the webinar for the speakers or you can save it until the end and just um, say your questions. Um, you can also raise your hand and there's a button to say whether or not you can hear the speakers as well. So also if you have any trouble with technology during the session, you can um, message me um, as well as um, there's a kind of Zoom FAQ that I sent out with the calendar invite. Um, so thanks for joining and I will hand it back to um, Andrea if she's able to speak now. Yes. Hi, everyone. Apologies. My computer didn't want to wake up this morning. Um, I am just going to give a really brief overview of the hub. I know many of you on the call have been involved in this hub for longer than I have. Um, but just want to give, for, for some of you who are new, just want to give a quick overview of the history of the hub. It was created in 2013 um, as a horizontal learning community, um, as, as all of the hubs in JLI, linking academics, policymakers, and practitioners working on issues of faith, particularly around the mobilization of local faith actors, um, looking at evidence for faith groups' activity and their impact. Uh, the, the group created a theory of change in 2014, kind of looking at shared experiences of how, how change happens um, working with local faith communities. In um, 2016, the group created a TOR and started to share case studies that reflected best practice examples of the mobilization. And now in 2018, 
we're really hoping to build a series of webinars like this one that we're on to draw together different work reflecting methodologies and mechanisms that really lead to mobilized faith communities. Uh, we also hope to work with some, some academics to develop some more formal evidence work um, and work towards some publication that really reflects key themes across these existing case studies. So we're excited about the year ahead. If you have any questions or you want to learn more or see the many existing case studies reflecting many of your work, um, you can visit the JLI website. I think it's lfc.jliflse.com. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Katrina to introduce Lauren, I believe. Thanks. Great. So thank you, Andrea. Um, so yeah, if you have any further questions on the web, you know, on the, the hub, sorry, please do, you know, get in touch after this um, webinar and we'd be more than happy to talk further with you about um, the role of the hub and, and some of the, the great things that we've got planned. Um, so today, um, the webinar is very much focused around looking at uh, disaster, disaster risk reduction and our response and looking at what the, the role of faith is within, um, within that, that realm. Um, and we've um, we've got um, two um, sets of, of presentations to um, to share with you today. Um, so we're going to take about thirty minutes to um, to present those. Um, but before I, I um, in, introduce our, our, our speakers, I just wanted to kind of put this into a little bit of context. And um, you'll see um, the slide now on the on the screen, um, which is um, taken us back to. Um, the the principle around um you know local faith actors being critical players in um, humanitarian development um work um that they play a great role in um in being that continuous presence um both before a disaster both during it and, and after any sort of crisis or disaster um so the pictures you can see there are um just to represent and show an image of that in terms of um, the role of local faith actors um, uh, during the tsunami in 2014 in Sri Lanka and um, and Southeast Asia. So, um, the uh, back in October of this year, uh, of last year, sorry. Um, let me just uh, just bear with me. Um, we um, there was a, a forum which was was held um, in Sri Lanka which convened a group of 142 participants from 36 countries. Um, the, the, the remit and the, the focus of that forum was um, localization, localizing response to humanitarian need and looking at what is the role of faith um, within um, the response to human, humanitarian need. So obviously with the, the, the wider discussions around localization, um, the, the discussions around um, the role of local actors in responding to humanitarian response. Um, the, the forum was, was looking at ways in which um, the local faith communities themselves play critical roles, um, whether that's within conflict and peacemaking, um, whether that's in the actual dis disaster response, whether it's within um, uh, working with refugees, forced migration, um, people affected by that, whether it's around disaster risk reduction and resilience, whether it's around um, gender-based violence, or whether it's around looking at the protection of children and vulnerable groups. So th um, the forum was a great opportunity to bring together um, people from 36 different countries, from different faith communities, both at the local level and, and the national and, and global levels to, um, to really press into um, some of the, the key issues and to, to bring evidence of, um, of where it's working, maybe evidence of where are, areas of improvement could be, could be made. And there's, there's a whole raft of, um, of evidence that has been created and, and is on the, um, the forum's webpage, which you can see there, lrf2017.org. Um, and there was also a call to action which was um, created at that point. So there's a lot of interest and um, we wanted just to be able to share that with you to kind of set the scene for, for our discussion today. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to jump into a couple of um, presentations now which focus in on, on one of the key areas that was covered in that forum on disaster risk reduction and resilience. 
Um, and first, our first um, set of speakers are Lauren from uh, Tear Fund, uh, the Impact and the Learning Officer, who sits within our humanitarian team, and Lydia Tanner, who is a consultant with Research People, which is a team of researchers engaged in innovative mixed methods, um, working predominantly in disaster and conflict affected regions. And Tear Fund is currently, has currently um, commissioned a study to look at um, its approaches to work working with the local church. Um, how do we prepare and support the local church to respond to disasters? So they're going to share with you some of the early findings. Um, I'm then going to um, hand over to um, Nagalyn Nasia from um, the Episcopal uh, Relief and Development, um, who is based in um, Sri Lanka. So he's been with them for nearly nine years um, from the staff of the Diocese of Colombo. And he's up, helped to oversee the post uh, tsunami relief and just recovery plans of the church. So Nagalan is going to share with us his experience um, of Sri Lanka um, to talk through um, some work that they've been doing on pastors and disasters toolkit. Um, you'll probably see some similarity between the two um, presentations um, and we will then have some time um, at the after the presentations for questions and uh, discussion. So I would just encourage you as as we go through the presentations if you have questions um, either jot them down or put them into the chat and then we will have time to um, to facilitate a discussion at the end. So I'm going to hand over to Lauren um, who is going to take us through the first presentation. Great, thank you Katrina. Just to check you can hear me okay. Yes, we hear you well. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone who's online. Um, it's great to have this time with you today. Um, as Katrina said, my name is Lauren KJ. I'm the Humanitarian Impact and Learning Officer at Tear Fund, so based in the UK. And we're really going to use this time um, this afternoon to really look at one of our primary DRR tools at Tear Fund, um, particularly looking at uh, intersection between DRR and the local church. Um, and so in 2011, we launched our guidelines for church leaders in disaster prone areas, um, or we call this disasters and the local church. And I, at the end, when I finish speaking, I'll share the link in the chat window so you can, um, you can have a look at that. And these guidelines really take uh, churches through the disaster management cycle, uh, the role of the church in disaster management, it provides some uh, biblical studies related to disasters, and highlight some specific good practice across a range of uh, natural disasters. And so when we when we rolled these guidelines out, this was really based upon demand. So, you know, which country teams really wanted to push into this issue um, and, were, and were keen to move forward with this. Um, and alongside the guidelines, we developed uh, training um, or we delivered training with our partners on some of the key content from these guidelines. So we're now uh, seven years um, after it was launched and we really wanted to then think about um, or better understand what kind of impact the training and the guidelines have had and also how we can improve this work at Tier Fund. So um, some key learning from us for us to think about how we can um, do our work better around this area. So in January, we commissioned um, the research people to lead a review for us. Um, and we've got Lydia on the line, um, who's uh, the lead researcher for this. And she's going to share just some of the very preliminary findings coming out of the review. It, it's quite early and we haven't um, finalized everything yet, but Lydia is going to pull out some key findings and, and share those with us today. So Lydia, over to you. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Can everyone hear me OK? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so as Lauren said, we, um, we wanted to look at how the guidelines um, and the training had been used, where they'd been used, um, and also start collecting some of the stories of um, the outcomes that had been seen as a result of the training to see if we could draw any common themes, notice common patterns um, in terms of people's experiences, both, both the partner experiences in delivering and supporting um, churches in responding to disasters and also um, the experience of church leaders themselves. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see a brief map. 
yeah, which just shows uh, where the guidelines have been used. And um, as Lauren said, it's, it's unlikely to be a comprehensive picture because there wasn't a systematic approach to rolling out um, the guidelines and training. It was very much demand based, but we've tried to follow the trail um, uh, from people in the tier fund office to see, um, to see where and how the guidelines and trainings have been used. And we've looked at the effect of those from both um, the perspective of church leaders themselves um, and then also from the perspective of the wider church um, and sometimes the wider community too. And we just thought we'd present some of the early findings that have come out of that research. As Lauren said, we're, it's still ongoing. We're about halfway through our interviews with um, church partners. Um, so I think arguably the biggest thing that we've consistently seen across the interviews that we've done um, is church leaders and partners talking about um, a new recognition of the role that churches can play um, and in particular what was emphasized from the guidelines and training was that um, the importance of, of sharing perspectives and discussing the reasons that disasters happen um, and of doing that from a biblical perspective with biblical references and so church leaders and partners have really talked about um, a new understanding of um, of a, a faith a kind of faith-led reason to respond to disasters and following on from that um, church leaders have also talked about uh, making changes within their own lives um, as a way of setting an example to the community around them so but by way of example uh, one of the church leaders I spoke to in Central America um, talked to me about um, how he'd had this realization of, uh, about playing an active role um, in preparing for disasters and as a result of that he'd started saving up seeds in order to prepare for flooding um, and then when that flooding did happen he'd been able to um, share seeds with his neighbors and he'd also been able to start um, teaching within the church environment about how um, how to prepare for disasters and, and and what some of the practical things that you can do um, and, and I think it's important to say that um, the church leaders really emphasize um, the need to have that situated within both biblical references and also stories of what uh, historical faith leaders had done um, in, in terms of responding to disasters in their own contexts and communities. Um, so then I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna move on to um, some of the, the change stories that we've seen at the community level, um, but Please do, if anyone has questions or would like to follow up with me afterwards, I'd be really happy to, to talk through some of the detail with you. But there, there's broadly six, um, six different things that have come out of the stories that we've heard so far. And I'm just gonna run through each of them quickly. Um, but the first thing that we've seen in the stories people have been telling is about building relationships. Um, so churches have talked to us about how the training and guidelines have helped them to establish committees within their own churches and also um, provide an awareness of the disaster response structures that exist both at the local and at the national level and how they might be able to engage with those. Um, and as a result of, of having a clear understanding of those structures, they've talked about working with both secular organizations and also with local government. And that being something that they had in particular in one case, been very reluctant to do in the past, um, but with a new kind of awareness of, of the role that they felt they could play in disaster response. Um, they talked of uh, being more proactive in establishing those relationships. Um, the second thing that people talked about was uh, helping their church communities prepare for disasters. And there was a really, um, a lovely example from Nepal of a church leader who had shared messaging um, around earthquakes that he'd gained from the guidance and um, uh, earthquake actually hit during the um, 
during the sermon and as a result he talked about how um, the churches had been able to or the, the church community had been able to protect itself um, because they had they had an awareness of some of the practical things that they could do um, and as the quote at the bottom of this slide shows one thing that's come through really strongly in, in each of these areas I'm going to talk about is that um, is a sense that the church um, is already often doing some of these things but the that training and um, guidelines can help them to have a more structured and reflective approach so not to say that none of these um, these stories of change that have happened wouldn't have happened otherwise but that um, the church leaders that we spoke to had valued the opportunity to sit back and, and think in a, in a more kind of organized way about how they could um, engage more proactively in, in preparing for and responding to disasters. Um, the third thing that came up was um, church leaders talking about having a more holistic understanding of vulnerability. Um, so in particular, understanding that it isn't just the people that come to the door who might um, be affected by a particular incident, but, but thinking through how different types of disasters um, or different types of um, uh, crises that, that people face, not necessarily um, you know, large scale disasters, but also smaller kind of crises at the personal or community level um, might affect different groups differently. And so, um, so churches talked about kind of more actively seeking out vulnerable people in particular demographics. And that was something that came out quite strongly in some of the interviews that we've done in Central America. Um, the, the fourth, and this very much relates to the previous one, um, was about needs assessments. And um, I guess this is taking an understanding of vulnerability um, a kind of a step further and formalizing that into uh, doing a structured assessment of the needs in a community. And it's interesting that some of the interviews that we've done, not so much with um, partners, but with um, staff members have really questioned what what the role of the church is in more formalized disaster response and i think there's been um different perspectives on that coming out um uh, that we're still grappling with in the research um the fifth one was around um contribution to a response and the thing that came out very strongly here was about um churches through training and, and through the guidelines being able to identify what their own resources are and how they can use them uh, in, a, in a response setting. And then leading on from that, the, the sixth was about um, the role that churches are playing in, in reconstruction. And again, this was the second area where we've seen different perspectives coming, coming through. And, um, there were there were lots of stories that came out about um, reconstruction of the of the church um, and uh, for example in the Philippines a partner told a story about how through the training um, the churches had been more mindful of where to rebuild um, church structures after the tsunami um, but they also expressed that some for some churches they don't see the um, they don't see the church having such a strong role in the reconstruction phase because of the um, funding needs and because it's often um, something that's much more long term. And so they, they talked about the role of the church within preparedness and within um, response, but felt that the, the church played a different kind of role um, in reconstruction that was more about the spiritual needs um, of the community. Um, so I'm going to stop there, but I'd be really open to uh, questions or to discussing any kind of specific points that people would be keen to hear more about. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lauren and Lydia. Um, we're going to hold questions to the end, if that's OK. And I'd like to now invite Nagalan to um, share with us a, a maybe more specific example from the Sri Lankan context of, um, of how they've been working um, in a fairly similar way on um, working with local pastors. Um, so Nagalan, can I hand over to you now to, um, to share? 
sure let me <clears throat> let me just share my screen Uh, just to the, the wider group whilst Nugland's getting set up, if um, if you do have questions and you want to post them in the chat, um, please do go ahead and do that. Um, but as I say, we'll have a, a time for questions um, after the presentations. Um, people can see the screen and hear my voice? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. So thank you, Katrina, for that production and uh, Lydia and Lauren for the presentation and for the hub for this opportunity. Um, uh, Episcopal Relief and Open sat on the steering committee of the forum that Katrina referenced earlier that was held last October and some of our partners participated in that conference. Um, this presentation is really a more detailed illustration of the experience of our Sri Lanka partner. And uh, if you were there at the forum last uh, October, you would have met. Um, so to quickly review what I'll be talking about, um, I'll start a little bit about our partners and specifically about the Sri Lanka experience. First, a little bit about our organization. For over 75 years, Episcopal Relief and Development, um, a ministry of the Episcopal Church uh, based in the U.S., um, has served as a compassionate response to human suffering in the world. Uh, the agency works with more than 3 million people in nearly 40 countries worldwide to overcome poverty, hunger, and disease through multi-sector programming using the SDGs as a framework. Um, it works closely with Anglican Church and ecumenical partners to help communities create long-term uh, development strategies and rebuild after disasters. Episcopal Relief and Development's model is one of accompaniment and not of direct implementation. We are an agency of the Anglican Church, and as such, we partner with local Anglican and Episcopal churches around the world. The Anglican Church has a communion of churches present in 165 countries, and this network um, of wide, grassroots, independent, local faith institutions serves as our primary presence in a country. So unlike the NGO model, we have no physical presence in any other country. We consider our partnership with these local faith institutions as our presence in our country. So our model relies on the capacity of these local faith institutions. We work with and through these local faith actors. And therefore, our priority has always been to enhance the capacity, the networking, and the skills so that these local faith institutions can play a greater role in their own context. And as we all know, faith institutions are where people go first during a disaster for comfort, food, water, shelter, etc., pastoral support. And the churches we work with are no different. Core to the work of our partners is the mapping of strengths and assets through a methodology of asset recognition and reinforcement. Uh, this is an approach of asset-based community development that encourages the adoption of policies and the application of activities based on the identification and utilization of the capacities and skills of people and their neighborhoods. It is a means of focus of strengths versus solely on needs. It is a methodological approach by which a humanitarian or development practitioner can become a catalyst that does not create or bring development to a community from the outside but rather energizes change and development from within. So partners go through a visioning process of identifying their assets and in recognizing and reinforcing those assets, identify interventions that can then lead to transformation. This methodology utilizes a series of activities and exercises such as the mapping activity you see pictured here and works to analyze the risk in the community and posit when, what a community can do to address hazards, vulnerabilities, and capacities. The process is both community-based and community-led. So in 2010, we did a global review of our emergency responses in high-hazards, cyclical countries. 
Um, the review acknowledged the strengths of our church partners in that they responded spontaneously, uh, quickly and instinctively to emergency situations. It was an affirmation of the well-respected grassroots presence of the local faith institutions. But the review also identified opportunities for improvement, including where churches had the potential to enhance their reach and enhance their effectiveness with the consistent and systematic approach that relies on greater collaboration with other stakeholders. So following this review in 2012, we began a process with the church in Sri Lanka to assess development and management based on the church's emergencies. We consulted with a high capacity partner to develop a unique seven module training of trainers curriculum over an 18 month period. Each module was one week long and then the participants had a two month gap to complete their homework exercises and apply the theory and then bring back learning to the next module. So after 18 months and seven modules completed, the training participants were asked to go back to their home regions and then develop regional strategies. The curriculum we used in Sri Lanka, along with adapting existing manuals such as the tier fund ones that uh, Lauren has added a link to in the chat screen, formed the basis of our Partners and Disasters Toolkit, which is our key resource as we build similar models of engaging local faith communities in disaster risk reduction globally. The toolkit, which is an open source document available online, was developed by 10 of our international church partners. and is now also in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And it's a wealth of tools, activities, exercises, and monitoring worksheets, and theological reflections, all of which we see as being effective in building church capacity. We have framed the, we have framed the toolkit into four simple but key competencies, as you see outlined in the slide. So that's community mobilizing, the two is assessing risk, then mitigation and preparedness, and then disaster response. But back to Sri Lanka. One unexpected uh, indicator of the success of the Anglican Church's efforts was that they were asked by other ecumenical denominations to conduct a capacity building program as well. So along with 13 other ecumenical bodies, there are now seven regional committees in key high risk areas around the country with the mission to work collaboratively on both disaster preparedness and response. These committees are charged with prioritizing preparedness initiatives and responding collectively during times of crisis. The Anglican Diocese has now empowered these seven regional committees to independently assess and analyze the risks in their own respective areas with other stakeholders, including the local government. In Sri Lanka, the uh, local government governments are mandated to establish village level disaster management committees. And so the regional, the ecumenical regional committees either work with these government committees or in target villages where there are no committees, help establish them in collaboration with the local government. In some of the village committees, the church has empowered and equipped them to build on a network of other assets to further their development goals. You will see in this graphic that different types of stakeholders are engaged as part of the work of the regional committees with white circles representing faith network groups, gray circles representing government stakeholders, and blue circles representing civil society, all of which feed into the theory of change that Andrea talked about earlier. Um, so I'd like to pause now for a bit and ask uh, Stacy to show a short video that outlines this work in Sri Lanka. There are other village committees that have also gone beyond disaster preparedness into disaster mitigation. Um, some have engaged in reforestation to strengthen soil erosion at the climate adaptation measure, while others are protecting their workforce to, to be more resilient to climate change, and others still with peace and justice active initiatives. And as for the Sri Lankan church, in their recent disaster response, um, with their own asset identification process, all of their relief efforts were locally funded. None of their traditional external or international partners like ourselves send funds for immediate relief. They have mobilized local 
resources for their activities in the relief phase and rely on external sources of funds only for the longer term rehabilitation phase if needed. Some of the successes of our faith engagement um, include a stronger and more cohesive community as different faith bodies come together on this shared goal. This has also strengthened the working relationship amongst these bodies, which have been also been capitalized for other advocacy campaigns. And as mentioned before, the motivation of an empowered community to work together on other development activities, networking with other organizations is a key success. Some of the challenges and opportunities for improvement include the consistent application of the methodology, the need of the regional teams, the reliance on one or two core energetic leaders in the regional teams, given that faith communities usually mobilize a large volunteer base without dedicated staff. And I think another consideration, which is not necessarily a challenge, is that the process is slower, given that it is community driven. But we expect this investment on community mobilizing will be more sustainable and effective in the long term. So it's really a model that we want to replicate in empowering communities to develop their own strategies and local faith actors to be catalysts on this journey. So I'd like to end with this graphic from the recent floods. In June last year, very heavy and continued rains from a uh, cyclonic weather system that remained in place for an unusually long time, Sam Sluice Gates resulted in floods and landslides in 15 districts across the country, with nearly 300 killed and missing and about a million affected. What you see here uh, was taken hours after the floods arrived in the southern town called Badigama. Here you have a local Christian priest and a local Buddhist monk together on a boat that will conduct a joint assessment in the region. Following this visit, the church and the temple worked together in coordination with the local government agent to house the displaced, provide food and water, arrange medical camps, mobilize their respective youth groups for cleanups, etc. All of which, which was done without international or even national intervention. It was locally resourced, locally led, and locally managed. So thank you for listening. And I think I'll pass it back to Stacy for questions. Thank you. Um, that both of those presentations were really uh, encouraging and, and had a lot of, as, as Katrina said, there's a lot of common themes between the two of them. I think a lot of great shared learnings. I want to go to the questions that have been typed in the box first and then open it up to the, to the broader group. Um, Maria Ann asked a question about the tier funds findings about the church's need to rebuild after a disaster. Marie, do you, Marianne, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I mean, both presentations are amazing, and certainly I'm, I'm learning a lot and would likely would like to uh, follow up at some point. Um, but my question in particular is that a lot of the times when, ch when we uh, support churches in, in doing some of the immediate relief, a lot of the times they come back to us and ask, you know, uh, what about us? What about the church itself? What about you know some of the infrastructure that you know that they themselves would have to rebuild some of the you know financial issues that are that are um, that that not, that are now straining them because of disaster. I, I I'm I'm just curious to know what kind of conversations you've had in in helping the church themselves rebuild, knowing that typically in a disaster um, response we work more with with the community and rather than the church itself i mean this is something that we're trying to figure out how we can be we can empower them more in addition to you know some of the support um, and technical assistance that we've been providing them thanks yeah thank you um so i think you raise a, a great point um when people when when we talked about um reconstruction in the interviews um as you said funding was often a a concern and it was a reason why churches sometimes felt that they didn't have such a role to play during the reconstruction period. Um, people did talk about some of the specific things that they'd learnt in training that had helped them reconstruct their own churches. So 
Um, I mentioned about, um, you know, types of buildings where, where to build, but certainly um, I would say that, that the interviews I had, that uh, feeling of being less able to contribute because of financial restrictions um, was something that came through quite a few times. Thanks. Maybe, maybe a kind of on the flip side of that, I think in Nagulin's presentation, he mentioned, he, he talked about examples of local financing. And so maybe you could share some examples of that and let us know, do any, did any of those connect to actually reconstruction or rebuilding of, of the church facilities and kind of their own internal structural needs as well? Sure. Um, for local financing, for disaster response, for example, the church uh, membership um, and individual members donated food, clothing, and money. Um, and along with the efforts of other ecumenical and other faith groups, the committees um, collectively aided relief distributions uh, for, to the affected. Um, and local financing for sort of mitigation activities, the church used um, their resource maps to identify local assets. For example, um, include the government forestry department donated seedlings for the reforestation project along um, a mountain sides to prevent uh, soil erosion, or they identified a water engineer from the community um, to advise on strengthening water sources and then apply to a water NGO for funding. Um, the committees make sure that they consistently liaise with the local government. Since, since in Sri Lanka, there are many schemes that the government has available. Um, but that are not always familiar or visible. Um, and then because these are community-led initiatives, not always do the financing go towards church infrastructure. Um, and so church infrastructure, usually the church itself has other sources of funds that they identify for um, uh, reestablishing either church schools or church hospitals or, or even the church um, sanctuaries themselves. Um, but most of the local financing goes towards community-led efforts that, that serve the wider community. Thank you. Thank you. Olivia, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Or I can read it. It's a great um, I can unmute. Um, I, I might just ask the final question for the sake of time, um, which is how do um, local committees link into um, the more, you know, political and municipal and local government structures that exist in the area and how um, they do their DRR efforts? Uh, thank you. That actually, that's to both Tier Fund and um, Episcopal Relief and Development, but um, a response from either would be great. Thanks. so I can start. Um, so um, as you mentioned, the church, um, all the activities are built, are built on um, existing relationships through their various outreach ministries, their interfaith forums, through their youth and women's networks, etc. So they mapped, they mapped it all out and with members of their congregations who had jobs or connections in civil society or government organizations made those wider connections. Um, at the regional level, there were also national connections that were used um, um, in the regions. For example, um, the government's National Disaster Management Agency, where the, the diocese has a connection, has branches across the country. And so then that, ne that connection was made and, and passed down to the region. The consistent message in all of the stakeholder engagement is the shared mandate um, of climate resilience and engaging stakeholder uh, stakeholders is, um, it's a challenging process and it's an ongoing process. Um, and since faith communities are um, relational and not transactional, there are always repeated efforts to build and maintain this common understanding of DRRM. Um, and out of this, strategies are then built. Yeah, I would, um, I would echo that. Um, I think what we've um, what we've seen is that those relationships um, often existed already. Um, they, they have different levels of formality, but they're often quite informal. Um, and for, for us, it was, what, what, what was coming out was that um, the training and guidelines had helped with a mind, 
mindset shift in terms of how church leaders saw their role in disasters. And so it was how they used relationships that already existed um, in order to kind of play a greater role within preparedness and response. Yeah, that's great. I, uh, Tara has a question about how the local faith actors are engaging with the, the humanitarian action, the international systems, um, clusters and such. Are they engaging or are they operating in parallel? Maybe both of you can, maybe, maybe let's start with Tear Fund and responding and go back the other way. Um, yeah, so from, from the responses we've had so far, um, the majority were, I would say, were operating in parallel. Um, there were, I mean, it, again, um, the churches had lots of relationships with individuals. And so it might be that there are um, relationships that exist either with individuals or with um, faith-based NGOs in particular. Um, but we didn't see very many formal examples of engagement. Um, apart from in in terms of needs assessment um, and also in a couple of cases of partnership uh, with a particular organization um, but as I, as I mentioned it was something that certainly within um, the interviews we did with uh, country representatives there were different perspectives on um, the extent to which churches could or would want to um, engage with those more formal systems. Yeah, and I'd, I'd, uh, I'd also echo some of that. Um, there, there, I think the JLI forum last October was in many ways a first for the, for the Sri Lankan church to be in the same building, let alone the same table with some of these larger humanitarian actors. Um, a group of faith institutions came together as an interfaith local host committee for the JLI forum. Um, and then the church continues to participate in this group um, and engage with some of the recommendations of that localization forum. And so that is, I think, building these connections that may not have been there before. Um, and that includes convening actually next month, uh, a group um, to discuss the definition of what faith leader is and recognizing the difference between local faith actors and faith NGOs. And they will also begin to participate in mapping out faith actor best practices and develop guidance notes on how the secular can engage with faith, act uh, with faith actors, all of which for the Sri Lankan context, but I think all will help in uh, further furthering the engagement with larger humanitarian players. Great, thank you all so much. These, this was really a great discussion, great presentations. I know it's given me a lot to think about and to to share with, To I, I have a number of people I wanna, will pass the recording along to. Um, if you are not already a member of the JLI Hub, we welcome you to join. It's a great space for learning. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn from each of you on this call. Information is on the webpage, which we referenced earlier. Um, thank you so much, and we hope you all have a great day, great afternoon. Just a quick announcement for those still on the call. In April, we'll have a webinar from International Care Ministries on their new randomized control trial, which is on the impact of their Christian Values Program on Economic Outcomes and Poverty Alleviation with their research director, Lincoln Lau. All right. Hope you all have a good day. Great, thank you. And this is Katrina here. Can I just add my thanks to everyone who's shared today from Aglin to um, Lydia and, and Lauren and um, for the great questions. Um, if you have any follow up questions um, to either of them, then please do um, kind of pass them via the, the hub and, and we're happy to put you into contact with them. So thank you very much. Have a good day.